Good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to thank, first and foremost, the CPBRD, uh, primarily DSG Jun Miral, Novel Bagsal, um, Director Pam Manala, and all of those who helped organize this at the CPBRD, as well as our counterparts at PIDS, the RID team of Sheila CR, and of course, headed by Dr. Uh, Dave Zerbeta. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the, our, my, fellow, my discussants this afternoon, um, Sandra Tablan Paredes, as well as E.D. Nino, uh, Nino Alvina, who was actually my former student. Uh, I'd also like to thank my co-authors, of course, uh, Dr. Vic Paqueo. At the same time, I'd like to thank those who helped out in the study. Uh, Ms. Angel Castillo, Rixi Madawin, uh, Robert Palomar, and Ms. Lucy Melendez. So this afternoon, I'll be sharing with you uh, the results or the highlights, rather, of our study that discusses the assessment, uh, an assessment of the criteria used in the determination of Philippine LGU fiscal viability. Now, there are two ways to create a Filipino local government. This, is, this could be through an act of Congress or by a local ordinance in the case of a barangay. The criteria used to determine LGU fiscal viability is in Administrative Order Number 270, Series 1992, and these are verifiable indicators of viability and projected capacity to provide services. And I'd like to underscore this provide services. And these are namely LGU income, population, and land area. Now, since the passing of the Local Government Code of 1991, the criteria used to determine fiscal viability of LGUs, meaning to create, convert, merge, or abolish, with the exception only of component cities, which was revised uh, through RA 9009 in 2001, has remained the same. Now, what are the possible implications of this uh, as an introduction? No. This, is, this could result in LGUs that are unable to provide above basic services, plain and simple. Given the current state of varied development across LGUs, which might be compounded with forthcoming increases in transfers with the Mandanas ruling. Second, as um, Dr. Meral mentioned earlier, and thank you for sharing the, the international uh, view of fragmentation of SNGs, no? subnational governments, it could give incentives for lower level LGUs to level up. The current distribution of intergovernmental fiscal transfers within the same level LGUs, i.e., that part which is equal sharing poses an incentive for lower level LGUs to want to level up to get larger transfers. From 2001 to the present, the changes in LGU structure was there was about 68% uh, 68 new cities created, about 46.9% of all of the, the changes in the PSGC. Uh, 25 new municipalities were created, 1.7%, and 107 um, or 0.3 percent barangays were created. Now Still on the, the, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be showing you varied capacities across local government units, which impact the ability to provide uh, devolved basic goods and services, including the inability, evidence would include the inability to consistently and some to ever receive the seed of good local governance, uh, varied infrastructure gaps across regions and varied outcome indicators as well across regions. Now, these are the research questions and objectives. Is there a need to redefine fiscal viability in the establishment of Philippine local governments? How does the Philippines define a fiscally viable LGU? This must first be answered in our study. How was this affected? How has this affected the delivery of devolved goods and services? And are there any other possible criteria or ways to determine viability? I understand that in 2017, there was already an effort with um, House Bill 6177 to to um, revise the LGU income requirement, which is what the study really focuses on. Um, this was passed at the House of Representatives, but I'm not sure um, where it is right now. Um, now, to examine how the current criteria to assess fiscal viability in, in the LGUs can be approved on, the study will examine how the fiscal viability of local governments is defined, will show the fiscal impact on LGUs of current criteria, and explore other indicators and or criteria or adjustments in current criteria that could be used to establish LGUs. Now, this is the next slides will just show you uh, the very development outcome indicators across regions. What we tried in the study was to identify the outcome indicators that could be best um, identified with 
performance at the local government level. So these would be based on the devolved services, such as in the case of health. Although it's not entirely the responsibility, of course, of the, the LGU, this is a devolved function. The national government also has a, a part to play in terms of infant and uh, maternal mortality. But in 2019, this is just to show that there are varied performance across the different regions. So this would show you NCR on the top and BARM. So this would be on the in the first graph here, infant deaths per 1,000 live births. So you would see it's high for NCR and, and low for BARM. And this would show you maternal death rate per 1,000 live births. So this would be NCR. The highest would be for the Karaga region. So this is just to show varied development indicators across LGUs, which is, could be possibly part of the impact of the inability to provide devolved services. Now, this one is based on a recently published article of ours in the Philippine Journal of Development, which we look at the governance and regulatory issues in the, the delivery of local water services. So here, this is also based on the PWSMMP of the, of the NEDA, the Water Supply and Sanitation Master Plan. Uh, the information there. So this shows you the percentage of households with water services by region. So this would be BARM, rather, CAR, NCR, up until region 13. And though there have been improvements from 2011 to 2016 in terms of access to potable water, so this would include levels 1, 2, and 3 no? uh, water systems, um, this is also varied across regions. Now, in 2020, we published a uh, a study, which was the baseline study on local government support fund assistance to municipalities, wherein we identified fiscal and governance gaps in terms of devolved local infrastructure services that still received assistance from national government, um, from national government programs. And these focused on identifying the fiscal gaps in municipal roads. So it was a survey of 1,373 municipalities. Municipal roads, uh, rural health units and primary evacuation centers in GDA areas. And what we found was that there was a fiscal gap of about 167 billion based on existing infrastructure in 2017, which I'm sure now um, has, has would have changed already what, what the fiscal gap would have been. Now, what this slide shows us in, is that in the case of the municipal roads that were existent in 2017, we estimated there was a need of about 133.3 billion to pave 100% all the existing roads in 2017. So in 2017, we did an inventory, we asked, we did an inventory of municipal roads and asked um, the surface if this is paved or unpaved. And the aim of DPWH at the time was to pave all uh, roads by 100%. So that's how we estimated the fiscal gap. And it's also to show here that there are varied um, performance indicators when it comes to municipal roads. We did the same for uh, primary evacuation centers, but we focused only on municipalities with geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. Um, uh, we asked how many of these municipalities had GDA areas that did not have yet a primary evacuation center. And we found that the gap um, depended on what was needed because it depends on, you know, structure, how many rooms, um, water supply. But we estimate the range to be about 2 to 12.2 billion based on 488 GDA municipalities without primary evacuation centers back in 2017. Okay. Now, finally, we also asked, um, we also tried to estimate the fiscal gap of rural health units based on the policy of the HFEP program of the DOH to have uh, one RHU per 20,000 population. And our estimate was that there was a fiscal gap of about 1638, which would range depending on the specifications. There are standard costing for these now from 17.9 billion to 21.4 billion. So this is just to show, again, there's varied um, outcome indicator performance and infrastructure in terms of the devolved services. Uh, services that were already devolved uh, back in 1991. Now, let's go to the crux of the matter. What is fiscal viability? Uh, it's the general ability of local governments to provide local goods and services. It is determined at a point in time where there is a move to create, convert, merge, or abolish a local government. So really, there is no 
thin, you know, strict line between the definition of fiscal viability and fiscal sustainability, but how the literature would typically define fiscal sustainability would deal primarily with the ability to pay off debt um, in the case of local governments. But um, Vox and Solquist in 2004 and 1996 suggested that it assumes that an LGU that is existent requires and requires that over the long run, the growth of spending does not exceed the growth of revenues. So, so this is a, a very tall order. This would actually be hinging on self-reliance, which is actually in section two of the local government code, as we know. But, but this definition has expanded the definition, original definition of fiscal sustainability, which focused only on the ability to pay off state debts. So what we will be doing is we'll be looking at how the Philippines defines fiscal viability um, at the point of creation or um, conversion of a local government unit. So that's what this summary table shows here. So in the first column, you will see what are the fiscal viability uh, criteria or determinants. So as I mentioned earlier, this would be income which is defined to be minimum average annual income for the immediately preceding two consecutive years. Okay? Then we would have the minimum population per inhabitant, and then we would have the minimum land area. But the focus of this particular study is really the income requirements. And I just want you to, to, you know, to take a look at this now. This is divided across the different levels of local government. So we have provinces here. We have cities, which is divided by component cities and uh, highly urbanized cities. And then we have municipalities, and then we have barangays. For barangays, there is no minimum average. The only would be the, in, the inhabitant requirement or the number of the population. But in the case of provinces, HUCs, and municipalities, the income requirement has not changed since the implementation of the local government code of the Philippines. So this is in 1991 prices for you to be able to put to create a province you would just need 20 million pesos. You would have to show proof of 20 million pesos of your, your income, uh, of that of the collection of municipalities or barangays to be able to create a, a province. But we tried as much as we could to rebase now from 1991 to 2018 prices, but it's hard. Um, so we'll have slight errors, but, but the 20 million pesos for provinces would be roughly about 73 million in terms of, in 2018 prices, okay? So we tried to convert the series from 1991 to 2018. So that's how you should, should see this. In the case of component cities, I mentioned this earlier, this requirement was revised by um, uh, RA 9009 in 2001. It, it amended section 450 of the local government code, increasing the requirement uh, for, for the creation of a component city to 100 million in 2000 prices. But the, but, but the odd thing is that um, the HUCs and, and you know, uh, the HUCs is still, the requirement is um, 50 million pesos in 1991 prices. At least that's how we've read the, the laws. No? So this would be equivalent to about 183 uh, million pesos uh, in 2018 prices. And what is surprising is, and which is our highlight, is the municipality. So... The requirement to become a municipality, uh, uh, the income requirement is 2.5 million in 1991 prices. So according to our rebasing, it is roughly about 9 million in 2018 prices. And later we'll be using this to compare it with, with the, the expenditure requirements that we have identified in this particular study. Okay, now have these criteria been sufficient enough to ensure provision of essential government facilities and services? So this is just a summary of the Section 17 devolved services in the local government code, now economic services, social services, and other services. And this is, there's a more detailed matrix of this right now as everyone is preparing for the um, devolution transition this year until 2024. So NBM Circular 140, I think it was last year, or 138, the National Budget Call, already identified a more detailed um, list of services that would be redevolved to local government units. Um, and we know not uh, why. Well, I'll be discussing it later on. But in a nutshell, um, LGUs are not self-reliant in the Philippines. They're highly dependent on intergovernmental. It's common in the literature, but um, I'll be discussing that in more detail later on. Now, for the case of uh, 
the theoretical framework for this particular study. We look at the literature on decentralization and on the optimal size of government. So fiscal viability is really part of the broader issue in decentralization, which is the optimal size of government or the local or subnational government in this particular case. Uh, OTA 1972 proposes that if there are no cost advantages or economies of scale with centralized provision, then a decentralized pattern of public outputs reflecting differences in tastes across jurisdictions would be welfare enhancing as compared to a centralized outcome characterized by a uniform level of output across all jurisdictions. So this would justify bringing uh, the delivery of goods and services that can be directly identified to local constituents or benefit the local constituents closer to them. Um, in practice, this has been translated by bringing governments closer to the people so that the goods reflect preferences of the voters, but balancing this with economies of scale with higher levels of government. So I'll be discussing some economic principles behind decentralization and federalism briefly later on. To, to show what this exactly meant by this. Some local public goods and services have spillover effects, so it would be beneficial for these to be provided by higher levels of government or inter-LGU arrangements. Now, what is the evidence on decentralization and the optimal size of government? Internationally, finding this balance between assignments has resulted in over-fragmentation. So multiple tiers or levels of government, which impacts the ability of these local governments to deliver goods and services. Now, solutions have been to encourage integration or amalgamation of local governments into larger units to become more efficient in service delivery and also take advantage of economies of scale. Like in the case of water systems, sometimes it would be beneficial for several LGUs because of the huge sunk costs involved in such infrastructure to cooperate, to provide uh, water supply more efficiently. Now, other solutions use um, Re recommend the use of horizontal or vertical cooperation or creation of special districts or an additional layer of governance to provide for goods and services that cross boundaries. Okay. Now, just briefly, these are the economic principles on intergovernmental fiscal relations, and they deal with identifying the principles behind the identification of expenditure assignments, as well as revenue assignments. So in the first column here for expenditure assignments, of course, it would be economic, it would be more efficient and increased accountability of local chief executives if you bring the delivery of public goods and services that benefit immediately the constituents um, closer to them. What would be an example of this? Um, uh, the garbage collection, that would be it, or um, street lights. Those are examples of public goods and services that should really directly benefit the local constituents. Now, there are also challenges and considerations in the expenditure assignment with regard to internalizing externalities, as we call it in economics, or the spillover effects. What are these? These are public goods and services such as local roads, which cross boundaries or water services, perhaps irrigation also. And in the case of others, let's say for hospitals um, or RHUs, sometimes one neighboring municipality might offer better uh, health services than the other municipality. So nothing would stop uh, someone living from another municipality going to that um, municipality wherein that person is not a resident. So these are what you call externalities and spillover effects in the case of local public goods and services, which might actually require a higher level of government or coordination across several uh, inter in, uh, LGUs. Also in the assignment of expenditure responsibilities, economies of scale in both administrative and compliance costs must be considered. My example earlier was, let's say the establishment of a water district. It might be beneficial for several municipalities to cooperate in this. So politically, this is a different question. Economically, this is what might be more efficient. And uh, let's say the redistributive and equity function of government. This would be, uh, in the case of the, typically this should be left to the national government, especially when it comes to income redistribution. An example of this would be, let's say the four piece program, which I heard from the SWD in their the devolution transition plan, it still would be absorbed by the, national government. But there are some that um, social welfare programs, which I think LGUs are already implementing, such as for the uh, AICS, uh, assistance to individuals in crisis situations, and PWDs, you already have your own uh, version of this, these programs. 
So this will be left because you can better identify your constituents and who needs um, assistance at your at your level. So so that that would be one of uh, the principles behind expenditure assignment. When it comes to revenue, bottom line, uh, let's say in case of taxation, the mobility of factors of production such as land, labor, and capital should what be what is what is considered. Um, local governments would typically be assigned responsibility for taxation of immobile factors such as land and properties because this one you cannot pick up and leave uh, a local government unit to evade to avoid the tax okay that's why real property taxes are assigned to to local governments because the the factor of production cannot you know it, it it's immobile it cannot be moved now administrative costs as well as redistributive costs are also considered in revenue assignments now what is the international evidence when it comes to the optimal size of governments and let's say fragmentation. Well, the centralized countries vary in the determination of the number of levels of governments. And the, the slide showed by Dr. Merrell from OECD would, would be evidence of this. Now, evidence also shows that higher fragmentation is more costly due to poorer expenditure management. The inefficiency in the delivery of services with an overfragmented government has led central governments, such as in Canada, um, in recent years to reconsider organization and structures of the levels of government. In almost every instance, major municipal consolidations and amalgamations have been initiated or driven by senior levels of government, with a major rationale generally being that of cost savings and improved efficiency. Many of these initiatives have been accompanied by offers of financial rewards for the restructured municipalities and if not, and nothing if restructuring does not take place. Now on to the results of our, uh, our methodology and the study itself proper. The methodology, data and scope. So we use the mixed method approach, uh, including descriptive and regression analysis using a combination of secondary and primary data. The, the, the baseline study, which I mentioned earlier, we published in 2020, we have uh, you know, a unique cross-sectional municipal database, which we combined with other um, information and data from other government sources. Now we have two approaches um, to the study. Uh, we do a regression analysis to determine the relevant, uh, relevance still of the existing criteria. And then we also do an exercise trying to estimate the cost of devolved function. This is challenging because there are different priorities across LGUs. But what we did was we tried to estimate the staffing uh, complement, the HR, human resource complement. How much would it cost to fill all of the LGC mandated positions? And that was our you know, approximation, preliminary approximation for the cost of devolved functions. Now let's see some stylized facts here. So these three slides here shows that, okay, um, we have here provincial income distribution, municipal income distribution, and city income distribution. What we see is that it is only cities that could typically finance all of its spending. And what do we mean by this? If you take a look at provinces, there are two columns here. The blue column represents the proportion of local services compared to the proportion of external services, um, sorry, of local income sources compared to the proportion of external income sources. So as you can see here, um, provinces are heavily dependent on external sources, which is primarily comprised of the internal revenue allotment now we know as national tax allotment. So that would be the trend line here on top. Okay, so we're just superimposing it here. The same story for municipalities. Okay, local sources are the blue column here. And external sources are the gray column. So the uh, external sources get, get a larger proportion of municipal LGU income. And the trend line still is that it's ERA. That is the primary source of external sources because we also have shares from national wealth and, all, and, and, and others. But it's really the NATA or the ERA. You see a different story when it comes to cities. So it's this, the income distribution of cities here you still have the blue column being local sources of income, uh, which would be tax and non-tax. And then the green column would be external sources of income. So the external sources of income, again, is ERA. And what we see is that um, by large, cities are more capable of raising um, revenues to finance uh, their, their, their spending. Okay. So th this is just a summary. I'll just skip this. No? Uh, it, compiles, it compiles provinces, cities, and municipal income distribution. Now for this one, 
This shows you the expenditure distribution depending on the four major sectors, uh, uh, general public services, economic services, social services, and then we also include capital investment expenditures here. As you can see for provinces, municipalities and cities, uh, general public services, which is the cost of administration or the bureaucracy, would get the largest share, yes. But in the case of provinces, they spend more on social services, while you would see more spending on capital outlays, especially for cities. Okay, uh, this is just a summary of that particular structure. Now, this one is very interesting. We just did an exercise. We looked at the share of um, provinces and municipalities their, I can't see uh, They could raise, so this is the local source income, okay? Um, to two factors, right? Okay, one would be local source income to LGU expenditures, and one would be uh, local source income to what we define as devolved functions. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Devolved functions, we just excluded education because it's primarily centrally, it's still centrally provided, and debt. Okay, so this is the total expenditures of LGUs as the denominator, Two kinds, no? Devolved functions, meaning net of education and debt, and then the other, including everything, current operating and capital out expenditures. So we looked at local source revenue, so local source income, no? As a proportion. And what we find here is that provinces and municipalities are able to finance only about 25 to 28% of their expenditures through, through local sources. For cities, it's not the case. You can see almost 100% here. So cities are in a better capacity as well. Now for examining the relevance still of the current criteria in establishing fiscal viability of LGUs, what we did was we looked at um, the impact of these criteria on local revenue raising performance and expenditure determination. So we conducted benchmark regressions just using ordinary least squares and fiscal and socioeconomic data all from government services, except for the primary data that we collected. So this is a reduced form equation based on best day and case in 1995, where G here would be either, it's a, a fiscal policy indicator. It's either total local revenues or total current operating expenditures. And then the explanatory variables or the viability variables we find in the local government code are population, land area, and LGU income. And then we have also, so the hypothesis are that population, land area, and LGU income, or its proxy municipal poverty incidence or LGU income class, should be positively associated with um, both local revenues and current operating expenditures. And for the last two, uh, this would be negatively associated with local revenues and expenditures. Now, vector ZI contains other governance and political economy variables, such as the presence of updated development plans, this is, though this is based on 2018 information, and investment programs, as well as years of office in, of the incumbent mayor. We have information of this, as well as the, the receiving the award of the Seal of Good Local Governance in 2017. So we use these um, other variables as, as explanatory variables. Now, what are the regression results for total local revenues, which is the left-hand side? So we're trying to see, okay, which of these variables are significant in the determination of total local revenues? So what we found was that population and the seal of receiving the seal of good local governance in 2017 had a positive impact on local revenue. So as population increased, and if that municipality received the SGLG for that particular year, there it was associated. Okay, we're not we're not establishing any causation, right? It's just associated with uh, increased local revenues. Land area and municipal poverty incidents, however, were found to be negatively and significantly related. What does this mean? As land area increased, it was found that it was expected that local revenues would, would decrease, while as poverty incidents increased, of course, it was also expected that local revenues would be lower. So that's, uh, those are the local, those are the findings for uh, the impact of the fiscal viability criteria and other variables on local revenues. So we also did the same exercise for current operating expenditures. Okay, the significant variables were population, land area, uh, current operating income, and SGLG, as well as the schedule of market values. 
the updated schedule of market values if it was updated in that year that we conducted the survey. And this is where it's surprising. The schedule of market values updated did not figure in in the local revenues, but it did figure in in current operating expenditures. So perhaps there's something that we still have yet to capture. Something's happening there. But in any case, it's nice to see that, well, as population and land area increase, of course, yeah, it's expected that current operating expenditures would increase. But the same thing with current operating income. Of course, as it increases, you would be expect higher expenditures. Same thing, seal of good local governance, if they received it in 2017, the year that our survey was conducted and for which most of the cross-section data was dated, uh, there is also a positive association with uh, current operating expenditures. So they might be in a better capacity to spend because they received the seal of good local governance. Remember, well, most of you was, some of you here might be local, uh, you know, local officials uh, that that know that uh, satisfying the requirements of the SGLG would mean that you would be able to to to, to deliver a certain level of governance as they estimated. Now, income classification was negative, okay, and this was also found to be robust. What does this mean? Um, this means that. While income as income classification increases, so it becomes six, no? it's associated with uh, lower spending. So what that means is that that's fine because uh, LGUs are classified from one to six. So the higher you are, that means you're poorer. Okay. The only governance or political economy variables that were significant are the SGLG and the updated schedule of market values. Although this one was only in the case of uh, local not local revenue, sorry, this should be local expenditures. Yeah, so there's an error there. Now, what's the importance of updated schedule of market values? Well, this would ensure a larger uh, or a more up-to-date tax base, okay? Now, these are the results. I won't go into them. This, uh, the slide earlier was just a summary of it. Now, I want to go on to this one because I have only five minutes left. Now, what are LGUs mandated to spend on? Well, ideally, in deciding the fiscal viability of LGs, it would be good to estimate the cost of the VOD basic services. The, though fiscal autonomy allows varied LGU priorities, local government code mandated positions are the same across LGUs, and therefore it would be easier to estimate um, a good candidate to approximate the cost of the human resource complement to implement the VOD services. So what we did was based on the positions prescribed in the LGC, classified as elective mandatory or optional, and the DBM manual position or, or classification and compensation, as well as the salary standardization law of 2019, we did an exercise. How much would it cost if we decided to fill all positions? We have two models. The first would be the elective and the mandated positions only, that's model one. And then the second model was model one plus the optional positions. And for each of the positions, we put at least three in that particular division. So in this case, these are the elective officials. So you're allowed to have a mayor. The salary grade is 28. The monthly salary, according to the SSL, is 142,683. But the thing is, um, according to the salary standardization law, uh, depending on your LGU income class, you can only max give a maximum salary of a certain proportion of what is allowed nationally. So we estimated that also. So for the elective officials, this is what it looks like. For the mandatory local official, appointive officials, this is what I mentioned, we put three persons at least. So for the department head, the salary grade maximum would be 24. Assistant department head for accountancy, 22, and then you would have the salaries. And then there would be next highest. So we put at least, we staffed with at least three persons per um, mandatory local appointive position. And what we came out with, okay, so this just shows you um, what I discussed earlier, what we came out with was the municipal human resource complement estimated cost. So the total cost of filling LGC mandated positions by LG income class in million pesos for the model one would be for the first class about 44.4 million a year. To. This is annual. For the sixth class, it would be 29.6 million. For model two, it would be model one plus optional positions. So this would be about 67.1 million. And for the sixth class, this would total about 40.4 M. So this is a far cry from the income requirement of what we approximated to be 9 million to become a municipality. So what we did was we just did an exercise. So this, is, this table shows you the proportion 
of the income requirements we established using model one and model two to three different denominators. Okay, total local source income, total LGU income, and total expenditure. So in, in the case of LGU sourced income, let's say the, the income requirement for a first class municipality to fully uh, staff elective and mandatory is about 60% of its local source income. It's 16% of its LGU income and 20.8% of its LGU expenditures. So you're fine here, right? You can still afford it at first class. But when you go down, let's say for model one only to the fourth income class, actually you're still in pretty good position. Remember that the maximum PS cap would be 45% to first to third income class, while it's 55% to fourth to sixth income class. So it's the fifth, income classes and lower that would be in trouble when it comes to model one. But in model two, it's only actually the first class that would be able to finance, let's say um, all of its, you know, about 31% of spending and still stay within the local government mandated PS cap. Okay, now this one, <laughs> this is even, Larger. So the fiscal gaps I described to you earlier as a proportion of the same indicators we described. So these are in proportions. So let's say for the first income class, we estimated the fiscal gap for uh, local roads, rural health units, and um, evacuation centers to total local source income of the first class LGUs, and it was about 254%, 1,000%. Okay, so I just the last two slides, if you will indulge me. So what are the general um, findings? Well, there's strong evidence in the need to revise the minimum requirements of LGUs to minimize the issues of fragmentation or there being a larger number of LGUs that struggle to deliver default basic services. Increasing the minimum LGU requirements would make it more challenging to become an LGU, therefore reducing fragmentation. Furthermore, redefining average income to be those locally raised would make it more stringent for LGUs to, to level up. Now, there could be an asymmetric approach to ensure self-reliance across levels of LGUs by reducing the subsidies received, let's say, um, but I know this would be politically challenging. Now, what are the recommendations? Amend sections 442 and 461 of the local government code to increase the minimum income requirement, allowing the, cre allowing the creation of municipalities, provinces, and HUCs as well. Uh, given the existing number of municipalities, what could be done to ensure improved delivery of services are the following. Encourage amalgamation or cooperation across different LGUs for certain functions that have spillover effects. If amalgamation or cooperation is a challenge, the good or service that has cross-boundary effects could be assigned to a higher level of government. The studies estimates for the LGU human resource complement are just a starting point for determining the the uh, the LGU income level wherein a municipality should be deemed as fiscally viable. Okay, future studies could be the review of the NATA distribution as well as enhanced inter-LGU cooperation. So these are my references and thank you very much. Looking forward to um, the discussions, presentations.